Thank you. Thank you, Deborah and b &H for having me and for all of you for coming out um, to hear me and look at old pictures of my family. No, um, <laughs> uh, my name is Nancy Borwick. I am a freelance photographer here in New York City. Um, I included, before I get into everything, um, I felt like it was important to sort of back up and tell you where I came from and how I got into photography to then better explain the project that I had been working on. So I'll just show you a few family photos. Um, I was always a storyteller as a kid. Uh, my sister said I was more, I was, I was really a tattletale, uh, but I loved to tell stories. Um, and I cared a lot about justice. So tattletale, whatever. Um, and I also, uh, just loved to meet people. I had I had no boundaries. I was one of those kids who was always talking to strangers, um, even though my parents, you know, were like, "Don't talk to strangers." I happily went up to everyone I could because I was so curious about other people's stories, um, and I think that lends itself a lot to photography and storytelling with photography because I think you need to be curious. You need to be open and vulnerable. And I was very excited to share with people everything about me, even at you know like age five. Uh, and they would share back. And that's something I didn't realize until I was older that that sort of equipped me to for what I do now. Um, this was an old photograph I just came across recently, um, which I love just because it was, I, I missed that time of sitting in a candy store, eating lots of candy, being so happy about it. Um, so I also include these because my project that I'll tell you about is, a, is, is about family. And um, my family was very close. Uh, and family was always very important to us. So I've recently come across all these old photographs that have brought me back to a time and place. Um, these are my parents. This is they actually they met in law school uh, when they were in their early 20s uh, in Queens at St. John's. Um, and I just wanted to move. And I found these recently, too, which I thought were amazing. They're a few photos from, the, from their wedding in the 70s in Long Island. Uh, you know, I think even wedding photography, I have recently kind of dabbled in that. And there is a lot of storytelling there. A actually, it's a very easy uh, place to tell a story because it's very, usually very linear. And um, there are moments to follow. But. Uh, so anyway, so this was this was my family, my dad, my mom, my sister, my brother, and me. Um, so uh, after studying anthropology in college, again, I just wanted to get to know people and understand the world and communities. I started. Um, I went to ICP. I did their photojournalism and documentary photography program. And after that, I had the opportunity to work for uh, Newsday newspaper on Long Island. And that opened a lot of doors to for me. I you know I was I was ready and ready, willing and able to to take on any assignment they would throw my way, whether it was a hotel that had just opened or um, a teen pageant. I was so excited to be shooting and working and and learning a lot. You know, sometimes like this picture, I was sent on an assignment to photograph this actor, and he hadn't acted. And he used to be an act. He was an actor when he was young, and it was maybe like 30 years since he had acted. And I show up to take this photograph, and the room, it was fluorescent lights, and the room was, was a baby blue. And it was, I walked in and was terrified. I was like, how am I going to make an interesting picture in here? Um, and one of, one of the big lessons I learned that day was, OK, you know what? You can't, you can't just show up with nothing. And, you, and I wasn't ready to show up with something that I didn't, I didn't feel proud about. So I'm standing there looking at him. I brought along this little video light that I picked up here. And um, and I just had this idea. I just shut off the lights. And suddenly, like I did not picture this, but I was like, it actually looked like a stage. I was like, I kind of gave myself a, a pat on the back for like being creative because you walk into certain situations and you're like, wow, that light is terrible. Or like, how am I possibly going to make something interesting in this situation? So you kind of have to trust yourself to just try out of the box, see what happens. Um, so anyway, I. <sighs> I really enjoy. I, I start, so I was working for Newsday and um, and really getting to explore different types of storytelling. Uh, whether it was breaking news, um, another lesson I learned when I 
photographed this. Um, this is when I first started shooting news, and I'm five foot four. And before I knew it, everybody was running towards the guy who was about to speak, and I couldn't. I couldn't get in. Um, I ended up standing on someone's bag to shoot over, because again, you know, when you're if you're working for someone or on assignment, or you really you don't want it. You have to get that picture. You find a way. Whether it's for me, it was whether it was through the legs or overhead. And actually, I liked how it came out. I feel like that added to the story. Um, sorry, uh, this was Kirsten Gillibrand the night that she won, um, was elected. It was her son's birthday, and I had an opportunity to be with her before the election. And to me, that picture was more interesting. Um, and again, like I've, I find, I think variety is the spice of life, and any opportunity to be photographing, I happily welcome. I think it's all, it's another, it's another tool in your tool belt. <laughs> Um, and you never know where, where the lessons you learn in these different situations, you'll, where you'll apply them. Um, this was one of my first assignments I did for the New York Times. And they wanted me photographing this man actually in front of this one piece of furniture. And I was like, I saw this wall. And I was like, oh, it's so visual and colorful and perfect. And sometimes, you, you know, I, I spend a lot of time, I'm sure you guys too, just kind of looking and watching, looking at the light or looking at the composition and being like, wow, that would be beautiful. And if, you know, like, I, you, can see, you can't help yourself. It's just how you see. Um, the reason, and the reason why I'm showing you all of this is to give you a sense of where I come from, um, because the project, and we're almost there, the project that I am here presenting um, is a personal project of mine. Uh, that I will get to after the Rockettes. Um, <laughs> so this, uh, quickly, the, uh, this is the last couple of, this, of the assignments. Um, sometimes you don't know if you can do something unless, unless you just try. And I just started working for the freelancing for the New York Times. And they were sending me to restaurants and sending me to do portraits. And I really wanted to shoot breaking news. Uh, but I learned that no one's going to send you to shoot something unless you've done it before, which is kind of a funny catch-22, but you have to sort of prove that you've already been able to do it. Um, I learned this lesson with politics. I wanted to shoot politics. Nobody was going to send me to shoot politics, so I flew down to Tampa and I photographed the RNC a couple years ago just to see, like, just to see what happened in that open. Like you, I took a lot of chances. And in this case, there was an explosion in the East Village last March. And I live nearby. And um, I actually, as soon as it happened, I ran to the, everyone's running away. I'm running towards the scene. And uh, I got on top of a building. And I realized that none of the other journalists were there yet. And so I called the New York Times and was like, I'm on top of a building. I, nobody's here. I have great shot, like great, a great viewpoint of the explosion. Can I be on assignment? And they're like, wait, Nancy Borwick? Um, and I was like, yeah. And they're like, OK, sure. And you know, I, it was, the larger lesson I learned there was just finding ways. You know, you, you have the picture. You, you have the, the drive, the, the need to tell stories, and, um, and just really pushing yourself and taking chances. OK. Now, sorry. It's also hard not seeing your faces because I'm just like, uh, can't see if anyone's even there. Uh, so this is my project, uh, Cancer Family Ongoing. Um, I'll let the first picture come up, and then I will tell you a little bit more. Um, so this is my, the long-term personal project that I have been working on, that I'm still working on. Uh, about two years ago, three years ago at this point, um, in December, my parents came into the city, and they, they lived upstate and took me out to dinner. And my dad told us that he had um, incurable, inoperable stage four pancreatic cancer. Um, and so obviously, you can imagine, I was devastated. I didn't really know much about pancreatic cancer, but devastated. Uh, even more so because at that point, my mom was already in treatment for stage four metastatic breast cancer. And suddenly, both of my parents were in treatment because they were essentially dying. Um, and I didn't know what to do. The next week, uh, my dad was going in for some doctor's appointments. And 
and he had said to me, I had photographed my mom a little bit. This was the third time she had had breast cancer. And during the, the second time, I was a student at ICP and had photographed her a little bit. Um, but I, I, did, I was, I think, a bit more immature. And I hadn't had the experiences I had had up until this point. And my dad approached me and asked if I would be open to photographing him. And again, the reason why I showed you my assignment work was to show you kind of where I came from. Because I think by being out there shooting, I was in some way prepared, if one can be prepared, to be in this situation and to be photographing this situation. I wanted to spend time with my parents. And the only way I knew how to was with my camera, because the reality was just too real. I, I will continue on from this photograph in a second, but the reason why I stop here is this is one of the first pictures I took of this project. Um, I would go up to chemo with my parents, and they were in chemo together side by side. My dad used to call these his and hers chairs. Uh, they would both get their respective treatments. And it was just so, it was so bizarre. I would go there really to support them. I wasn't thinking, oh, this is a project. And oh, I, maybe I'll publish it. It was like, I just need to be there with my parents. But I don't know how to just be there. I'm terrified. And something clicked. Uh, I think I remember sitting there on the floor watching them thinking, I had a moment of clarity where I was like, wow, this is very symmetrical. Look at it. Like, what, what is this composition? Like, my, my brain went there, and I photographed it, not really knowing why. I just did it. Like, I, it was my security blanket. I had my camera, and I knew I could, if I was taking pictures, maybe I wasn't fully there, and it was protecting me in somehow. Actually, the following week, I went back and did this picture because I didn't feel like I had a wide enough lens. So I came home and I, I borrowed a 20 millimeter and went back because the room was too small and I photographed it again. Well, the story kind of initially started because they were in treatment for cancer. I learned pretty quickly that the story that I was telling was not about their disease. It was about their relationship and their love story. Um, they... This was a strange situation for the two of them to be in, and for a husband and a wife to be caring for each other, but also caring for themselves. Uh, but they also had this beautiful humor. And I, everyone deals with this kind of stuff differently. And my parents turned to humor. Our whole family turned to humor. That's just sort of how we, how we were. Um, all the while, always having my camera on my shoulder. Not really sure what I was doing with it. I hadn't shown it to any of the photographs to anyone, because it was just my journal. And not really sure where it was going. Obviously, I didn't know where it was going. But I felt like you don't choose, I, I mean, I don't think you choose a pers to, to start a personal project. I think often it happens, it comes to you, because it's something personal that strikes you, or something in your family. or um, And whether I felt fully prepared to be photographing this at this point, I had no choice. You know, that was the, the cards we were dealt. They were both sick. and. In some ways, I really just wanted to, to document everything so that I could have it and remember it and have that archive of who they were. Because I feel like even in these stressful moments or painful moments, I was able to, I can remember the essence of who they were, how strong they were, and how, and, and how human they were when they couldn't be strong. And that's important to me. I don't see them, and I don't think they're Ter I don't, I'm not like, oh, they're so sad. Like I, I'm obviously sad from the memories, but um, the way, just watching how they dealt with it. And also, I think when you're working on a, on a photo essay, a picture story, whatever you want to call it, you, you always hope that you want your subjects to trust you and be vulnerable in front of you, because you, you want to be able to tell the best story that you can. And in some ways, yes, these were my parents. I was going to have the ultimate access, but these were my parents. You know, like the, I, the access was there, but like, what could I? How could I manage, and and understand what I was going through while they were going through it? Um, there, I found, and I have found this in other work, um, but it's important to spend a lot of time with your subjects. At the beginning, I was going one, once a week for a few days. And then I realized I was missing things. Because they would mention something, and I'd be like, wait, you did that? Or wait, you like this happened? I had no idea. 
And then I realized that the key was to be there because they're not thinking, oh, this can make a great photograph. We should call Nancy and make sure she comes up here. Uh, it was also a little tricky because whenever I would go home at the beginning, um, I, it was a novelty to have me around because it had been a long time since I had been home. So they were, they were very aware of me. And you know, as a photographer, you often want to sort of be um, a little lost in the mix, maybe the fly on the wall. Um, you just want to be the observer. So this is one of those details that I was walking. I, this is actually right, uh, right after I did that photograph. And I was like, I don't know what to make of what just happened. Like, I, I'm human. I obviously was feeling what was going on. Um, and then this was another detail. I felt like it was important to show what I was experiencing um, as it was happening. You know, I thought my mom was doing the mail, and it turned out she was looking at cemetery plots. And you all, I mean, many people know the conversation where someone wants to talk about the plans, and you're like, no, like it's not time for that. And and no, I don't want to talk about it. But she was very clear, and and just felt like it would be important to straighten all that stuff out. And I, I. It was a gift. I didn't realize that because she she didn't want to leave the burden onto my siblings and I um, when the time came. Um, there were also some some light and wonderful parts of this process. Uh, we um, we joke. My, so my mother, her chemotherapy kind of made her bloated, and she hated that because my father's chemotherapy. Um, and, and disease, really, he lost like 40 pounds. And she was like, this is so unfair. He loses his hair, he loses weight. He actually doesn't look that bad. And like, <laughs> cancer is sexist. Like, I'm bloated and, and, and he has to, we had to go out for meals, calorie, we called it the calorie dense diet. Um, because he needed to gain weight. It was a lot of ch a fried chicken, a lot of Chinese food, a lot of pizza. And of course, as a family, we were all on this diet to support him. <laughs> um, and eating our feelings. Uh, and that's actually the, one of the few occasions where you actually see me sort of eat literally in the pictures. That was my fried chicken. Um, and it's just daily life. Like we're regular people and, and cancer doesn't care who you are. Uh, I mean, and not just cancer, it's illness and life. It's part of life. Death is part of the life cycle. And that was something we really came to understand. Um, all the while, uh, my then boyfriend and I decided that we wanted to get married. Um, his mother had, had died of cancer uh, when he was young. And after a couple weeks after my dad told us his diagnosis, I turned to him and was like, look, we've been together eight, seven years. Um, I know we've talked about it. We didn't, weren't going to rush. But like, I think we have a reason to rush now. I really I want them there. Um, and at this point, so this, the first, I decided I was going to show the work to someone. Um, and that's with personal, personal work, you're terrified of that. Because what if no one cares? What if it's, I mean, not that what, what if no one cares, but it's so important to you and personal to you. And you're being very vulnerable by showing it to someone. You just have no idea. And I showed it. I um, showed it to a couple of friends, and then I, on a whim, decided to submit it to a contest. I had seen who the judges were and thought, you know, I'm just going to put it out there and just see if anyone reacts to it. Like, see if any of these judges, I don't know, I, I didn't know. I was just really didn't think that much of it. Um, and after I, this was right before this photograph, after I submitted it to the contest, I got a, an email from Jim Estrin from the New York Times Lens blog. And he said, um, I, I'm moved by your story. We want to publish it on the Lens blog. And I was like, what? <laughs> I went back to my parents and was like, so the New York Times is interested in publishing some of the work of you guys. Like, What are your thoughts? It's photographs of them, very vulnerable, very open. Um, and we had a long conversation about it. And they both agreed that if this was something that would help me and help others, then what did they have to lose? Um, so I wrote back to Jim, James, and I said, uh, OK, we're on board, but can we also get it in print? Um, I felt like there's a whole community of people who might miss it just online. And as a photographer, you dream of your work in print. Uh, and three days later, he got back to me and said, OK, we're in print, metropolitan section, cover. So but, but the only. Um, Thing was we needed to have a photograph from the wedding. They wanted the story of my parents to kind of lead towards this wedding. 
so how are we going to do that? Because he wanted me to take the photograph. <laughs> so I thought a lot about this. And I was like, OK, there's, you know, I learned earlier from my strategizing on assignment, there are ways to get these things done. You just have to be clever about it. And we realized there was a tree above the chuppah. And maybe we could rig a camera in the tree and, and trigger it remotely. Um, <laughs> Sure, why not? So the morning of the wedding, I climbed a tree and rigged a camera and set everything up. Um, I composed it. You know, I knew exactly what I wanted. Wanted that hoopa, wanted those chairs. Um, and when it came time to decide about how I was going to trigger the remote, I, I thought, you know, maybe I'll put it in my bouquet. But then I also thought, man, my husband would kill me if he thought if he knew that I spent walking down the aisle and our ceremony triggering a remote, <laughs> working, working our wedding. Because um, I already I work every other part of our lives on camera. I'm always shooting. And I just thought, you know, this one moment, I just I did compose it, and I did everything else. So technically, it's my picture. But I did ask my friend, who's also a photographer, my assistant, um, to trigger the remote for me. She's the girl with her head turned. And this was pure luck. As you know, photographs, sometimes some of your best are pure luck. and. I'm grateful for this because in Jewish tradition, you have both your parents walk you down the aisle. And it was so special to me to get to see all of, see that from the larger perspective. And I get to keep this and look back to this. And, and we were lucky that the veil you know, framed me and all of that. Uh, so anyway, they ran that in print, and, which was amazing because I did have a camera like under the uh, everywhere. I had cameras everywhere that I could use. So the New York Times, um, this is how they published it, uh, about two and a half weeks, two weeks after the wedding, three weeks after the wedding. Um, and then Len's blog published it online. Uh, this crazy thing happened. And right after it was published in print, the International New York Times um, emailed and requested to publish a couple of the images in their Monday paper. And that was crazy for me, because I'm just, you know, I'm a freelance photographer in New York just hustling the way we're all hustling and, and, and just trying to communicate with photography. And here I was about like my personal life about to be out there for the world, really the world to see. Um, and it had this amazing ripple effect that both of my parents got to experience. The day after it ran, we were, the day after it ran, it was, a ch it was challenging because it ran on lens on October 18th, 2013. It ran in print October 20th, 2013. 13 and October 20th, October 19th was the day that my dad was jaundice. Um, and you can't tell this in black and white, but he was yellow and it was a sign that things, I mean, he had pancreatic cancer and had been in treatment for over a year or for almost a year. So we knew that time was of the essence. And that's another lesson I really learned when you're working on a personal story or you're thinking about working on a personal story. Um, I encourage it because you, you really just don't know what kind of time you have left with people. Or once they're gone, when you, when you maybe don't have the chance to ask them the questions you want to ask them. Um, so uh, following that publication, literally to the day, uh, things started to turn uh, for my dad. And we it, it, there were a lot of things going on. And, and, and I always had my camera, like I said, not really sure what was happening and kind of scared of what I thought was happening. This was that that had been the moment after he got his DNR bracelet. Um, and we were our family was basically living in the hospital. A thing about photographing in hospitals, most hospitals, every hospital will say no. Um, but as photographers and as you know, storytellers, I feel like you they only they say no once you ask them. I think it's important to, if the story is important to you, you have your camera with you. And especially if your subjects are saying yes, they, they, some people say kind of shoot until you can't shoot anymore. You know, shoot first, ask second. You know, like, uh, and, and with a hospital, I, I knew that I was, somebody was going to get mad at me. But I also knew that if I carried my camera around with me at the hospital every time, maybe they would. Maybe people would just assume that I had permission. Um, and I acted like it was no big deal. And, and almost nobody said anything to me 
which was amazing because I'm on every camera in that hospital with my with my camera. Um, uh, there's one picture that's not included, which my mom was getting an MRI and I was outside the room shooting in. And in the reflection, you can see the like manager, the boss was next to me yelling at me. And I was like, shooting, shooting, shooting. She's still yelling at me, shooting, shooting, shooting. Like, whatever, I wanted the shot. Like, what was she gonna do? Anyway, um, another lesson, just, these are like my weird lessons that I've learned through the process. And you kind of, you know, you learn them as you, as you experiment and do. Um, so I include this picture because sometimes people ask me, um, how, how did you do this? How were you there with your parents as they were really sick and have the, 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 the wherewithal to be photographing it and composing and, and thinking and really working the situation? And I always say that the camera was, was therapeutic and, it, and by photographing it, I could better understand my parents' story, but it also gave me a certain distance. The way when I'm on assignment, yes, like it's devastating that this building exploded, but my purpose was to, to tell the story with the, through the image and that would help in some way or be meaningful. Um, the one, almost, probably the one time that I ever put my camera down while photographing my parents was this moment. I, I do feel things, and I had been at the hospital with my dad and my mom, and the scene was so familiar, I'd over-photographed it. Because every time I would go, I'd photograph, because I wanted a better version of the thing I took before, now that I knew what I was walking into. And uh, I saw them struggling to find a good vein in my dad's arm, and I just thought, you know, I've photographed this before, like I don't really need to be photographing this now, and I put my camera down. And then the next thing I knew, I was being walked into another room and put on a bed. I, I think I began to faint. Um, and that's, I've never experienced that before. And I think that was the reality that I, I really was using the camera to, to, to sort of distance myself. Um, and the one moment I put it down, I was like in the other room. And, and a few minutes after I was laying on that bed, I heard giggling. And my mom came out from the other room with my camera and photographed me. <laughs> and she was like, ha, 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 how the tables have turned. Um, which brought me so much joy, even though I think I'm rolling my eyes at her. Because it was important that, that this, it wasn't just me photo taking from them or photographing them, that it was a collaborative experience. I think when, I, when you work on a project with others, I think it's important that you share with them and engage them. And, be honest with them as they're being honest with you. Uh, I, you know, all the, all the while I was showing the photographs to my parents, um, just trying to gauge their if what they were seeing was what they were feeling, and, and just being. Ha they were a collaborative part of the process. Um, photo credit Laurel Borowick. <sighs> so this was. Uh, like I said, we were kind of living at the hospital, and this was thank this was after Thanksgiving, 2013, um, and my dad took a quick turn uh, that that uh, the week after, just kind of overnight, which we were sort of expecting, but didn't expect. You know, we, he was he was in treatment, and he seemed to be doing pretty well. And you you always want to hope, and I hope is really important. I think hope kept him alive longer than. He would have been alive. I, I, he wanted to live and try and be there. And, and the cards he was dealt um, gave him as much time as he, as he got. His parents both died, unfortunately, of cancer when he was pretty young. Uh, his dad died when he was a baby, and his mom died when he was 15. So he believed that he would never live to see each decade. And we talked a lot about this. That's the other thing when you're working on a personal project. I think you just take advantage of the time you have with the people you love and just talk to them. And I mean, I was recording everything because I knew I wouldn't remember it. And I wanted to remember it verbatim. Um, and he used to say, you know, I never thought I would live, I would never, never thought I would live to the, the, the next um, decade, but also life was a gift and no one promised us longevity. 
and it was such an interesting, he was very, very profound his whole life, but especially profound in his, in his last couple of weeks. I think he really knew, he knew what was coming and was able to share with us his impart, his, la, his last imparting wisdom, last, you know, wisdom before he passed away. And there were just so many lessons that we were learning from him at that time uh, that have allowed us to move forward and sort of continue to live our lives. Um, but this was the moment after he died, which was totally surreal. And, you know, immediately I, like, took a photograph because I was like, this is not, I can't believe, he was here a year ago. He died a year and a day after his diagnosis um, on, this, on the 40th anniversary of his mother's death. December 7th, which was chilling. Um, the TV kept flickering, and it kept flickering on with football, which was like, he, we were like, okay, Dad. But like, we were sort of laughing through our tears. Cause we thought he, was, he wanted to watch football, love football. And uh, we just had this moment. And I actually like remembering. This picture reminds me of that moment, um, which I like to remember, because it was a special. We felt like, okay, yeah, even in, in death, he's, he's like, having his way. Um, and this was the funeral. Uh, whenever I walk into an assignment, if I have some time, I like to mentally think about my dream pictures. Uh, I don't know if you guys do that at all, but like you know what you're heading towards or you know what you want to get. And I like to make a, a mental list of the dream pictures that I'd like to take or that I think would be powerful in the story if they happen to happen, like if they, if they happen. Um, I knew I wanted a photograph uh, of the audience, not the audience, the the, peop the friends and family at the funeral because I felt, well, first I could hear my dad in my ear being like, Nance, like, this is still my story and like, look at all these people who came out to see and like, remember me. Um, but I knew I was going to be like a mess when I got up there to give my eulogy. So I actually went in before the ceremony, set up my camera, like I looked at my settings, I, I had a... Th I, most of the time I had a 35 millimeter 1.4 lens on because I wanted to be mobile and not be carrying a lot of gear. And actually, no, I take it. Oh, I, I did that, but in this case, it might have been the 24 because I wanted to be wide. I set it up, and um, when I got up there, I told everyone what I was doing at the end of my eulogy and took the photograph. And what you can't see is actually on the sides. There's many more people, but. It, it served its purpose for me, too, because I don't remember anything from that day except for what I see in the photographs. And my mom was smiling, which was we always thought was kind of funny. Um, but she said, you know, he was no longer in this pain, but also everyone he loved was there. And, and not with Jewish tradition, unlike at the wedding. Um, my dad decided that he wanted to be buried in his favorite Giants jersey. Um, his hat, his favorite hat, his favorite jeans. Because I remember saying to the rabbi, I was like, so what's tradition? He's like, well, your father was never one of tradition. Um, and, and even looking at the, the body before, you know, usually it's not open casket, but I, we really wanted to kind of say goodbye to him. And honestly, we were laughing when we opened it because it was so, it was so him. Um, and I could even see my mom smiling a little. And so that was just, it's important. It was important for me to see that. Also, I think in seeing the photographs, I'm able to distance myself because he didn't look like himself anymore, um, which I think helped with the separation. Um, and and so I just I, I didn't take that many photographs at this point, but I took a few. Uh, the cemetery and we sang his favorite songs, and it started to snow, and it was just everything seemed to have new meaning. Um, and of course, we got home and our house was full for Shiva, which was. Amazing, but also exhausting. So after this, I reached out to the New York Times again, and I was like, OK, I know this is crazy, but you ran the first piece. Would you be willing to run a little follow-up on my dad? There were a lot of people who saw it. And you know, the story didn't end with my wedding. It continued. And that's the reality of life. It just it continues. Um, and they said yes. So they ran um, a spread online and a single frame in print with a little caption, a little um, thing of information uh, about the circumstances. Um, and before, I was, I was going to go on to the, to the third section, but before I do, um, is there anything that, like, that any questions anyone has, or should I just continue? It's almost finished. Continue? OK. I could go on forever. Um, now that I have you here. Uh, 
so, but the reality was um, he was gone and my mom was still sick. And now the focus was on her and my siblings. You'll start to see them a lot more in the photographs. It wasn't, I wasn't excluding them before, but I think it, the focus was on the, the two together as a pair. And now it was her as a single, and, and it was a challenge. This was her birthday. This was the first birthday without him. Um, and I took her out. At this point, her cancer had spread, and it was hard for her to walk. So, and she also hated being in public. And again, tricky, because in a normal circumstance, you're, not, you're trying not to inter vein with life, that, the life that you're photographing, telling the story, you're trying to let them live their life, how they're gonna live their life, but I'm her daughter, like I'm gonna, we're gonna go out and do some pottery, we're gonna wear crazy wigs, we're just gonna have the best, goofiest time ever, the way that my whole life she did for me. Um, and I know that it was hard for her to allow me to do that, to allow me to, to take care of her, um, but I'm grateful she did. You can't tell in the black and white that she's wearing a bright pink wig, I think. Because um, she, she used to hate being in public. She felt like people noticed she was wearing a wig. So I thought, why don't we both just stand out wearing outrageous wigs? And I think that was the trick. Uh, but then there were moments that I started to really understand just how hard it was for her. Uh, not having my dad around meant that after those 34 years of being married and being a pair, she was now alone. She was now a single, and that meant maybe there was a, a seat at the head of the table waiting for her because she was one, so she didn't necessarily have to sit next to anyone in particular. And I don't, I don't know if she thought about this stuff, but I certainly did. And then it became, I started to look for it, ways in which life had changed without him and showing his absence. And this was uh, Passover, I think. Um, and that's our, my sister's dog. We just started to spend more time. We, as a family, it, it was weird going from a family of five to a family of four. And we just wanted to spend time with each other. Another, some people are not big fans of detail photographs. And I personally love them. I just think in a larger sto photo essay, you can include them because they could be really valuable. I include this because, you know, we're, after my father died, my mother was busy trying to figure out what to write on his footstone. All the while, she was sick and in treatment and dealing with her own mortality. But at the same time, she also had other things on her to-do list, which was very our mom. You know, like it said, you know, order Howie's headstone, um, join the gym and start going, decide about radiation. Like, what happened to the Girl Scout cookies? Like, just the simultaneity of life. I found that, you know, and I've obviously had time to look at these and think them through and, and realize what exactly I was seeing. But sometimes you just have to collect. Like I knew time, I didn't know what, how much time I would have, so I just, using my camera to archive everything. And in this kind of circumstance, I could show you a wide edit, <laughs> which I think is important. The other thing about personal work is it's so important to share it with other people because I feel a personal connection to every single one of these images. And when the New York Times says, okay, we can only publish six, I'm like, okay, how do I possibly choose six? Because I have, you know, I, there are reasons why I love all of these. And having other perspectives to sh looking in on the work is, can be really helpful because they could also suggest things that you might have not thought of, things that you might have missed because the story is so close to you. Um, another detail I'm stopping at briefly, um, this was important. This was a big moment for me. Um, I was going home a lot. My mom didn't like to let on how sick she was. She was being a mom and protecting us and doing, being the, the laurel that we all knew. She was just so selfless and didn't want to worry us. But I remember going home one day and I just thought I'd check the mail on my way home. And I opened the mailbox and I could tell she hadn't checked it in probably a week. And to me, that was a sign that something had changed because that was so out of the ordinary for her to not take, get the mail. It was like the, the most simple task ever that we, like everyone did or everyone does. Like every day you check the mail and this was a sign to me that she didn't, that she wasn't even making the effort to go up the driveway. Um, so I felt like that was, that's important. That's an important turning point for me because that's when it became much more real. Um, and it's strange. 
I, so I, st I started taking less photographs. I had my camera with me, but I, I started to see the change in my mom. It's strangely at the very same time that we saw the change in my dad, like October of the following year. Um, and this, this killed me. I was, I was actually at a wedding um, in Buffalo, and I stayed up in Buffalo to photograph after this big, um, after this, that big snowstorm last year. And I got a call saying that the oncologist was coming to the house um, to advise my mom on hospice, that he, after 18 years, really was, there was very little that they could do. Like, and, 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 and honestly, she, I don't know how she went through everything that she did. It was so unfair, universe. But she was a trooper all this time, and, and, but she was in pain. And I got home, and there was an oxygen machine, which we playfully called Wally, the cartoon. And he like beeped at her and whatever. And we found, we tried to find joy and lightness in that time. But I, I also, again, like I didn't take that many pictures because I, I was really starting to feel the reality of what was happening. Because um, she was always the rock. She, like even when she was sick, she was taking care of my dad. And it was amazing. We went through some of her jewelry and she told us stories. We knew what was coming and we decided that we were gonna make the most of our time left together. And I like to remember that because it was a really beautiful time. I feel like in, in our world, we honored birth, but we, we fear death. And death can be, is, is just as profound. And to honor someone's life at the end of their life, I, I found, we found really meaningful because she lived this beautiful life and she deserved to share what she wanted to share and tell her story and feel like she made a stamp on this world. Um, my grandmother, her mother, came around and showing us some old family photos, which was amazing and terribly difficult because my grandmother is 88 and here she is mo essentially mothering her daughter that she hasn't you know, taken care of in decades. And, it was both hard, but it also gave her purpose at that time, which was important. This was uh, a strange night. This was kind of the last time she ate anything. Um, at this point, my sister, you know, you never know how, or some, sometimes you don't know how sick someone is, especially if they're trying to keep it from you because they don't want to worry you. And it was just my brother and I at home with my mom, you know, doing the normal things, and she seemed okay, but we really didn't know. The doctor said, you know, it could be months, it could be weeks, which is crazy to think about because you live in this world of what if, when, how, like, it, it felt there was a sense of urgency that my mother certainly felt, and she wished, even though she had these 20 years, essentially, to, to, to think about her death, she wished she had more time because she wanted to do so much. She wanted to write us these love letters and she wanted to, you know, take care of things that hadn't been taken care of yet. And she still had a stack of mail that she hadn't gone through. Like in her mind, there were all these things and it kind of, the lack of time at the end was really what worried her. Um, but then the next, so the next morning, um, I had slept in her bed with her that night. Sometimes you really have to get you know, into an intimate situation with your subject. I nowadays I actually I invite myself into people's homes all the time when I'm photographing them. I'm like, oh, like I would love to see I would love to see stay for dinner and breakfast. Do you mind if I sleep over too? And usually they are okay with it because um, there's some really I think that the most beautiful moments happen in and the most real moments happen you know at, in, in the morning or at night when you when you have your guard down a little. But this morning, I remember my brother and I, when I got up and I went to have brunch with a friend and I came back and mom was still in bed. Um, and that was really, she didn't get out of bed at that point, after that point. Um, so the next couple of days were really hard for us. We basically were living in her room with her and, and just trying to be there for her and support her. And we watched a lot of movies. And you know, I, as I said, I took a, f a couple of photographs, but I really just, I was trying to be there. And it was, it was scary. I, she didn't want to die in the hospital like my dad. And ho we had never experienced hospice before. And she, was, she, wanted me to, she wanted me to photograph it. She wanted people to see what home hospice looked like. Uh, and so I did. 
um, just t play, taking these roles on and um, just being there with her. Um, and this photograph, again, it's a moment that it upsets me, but it also I'm, I'm, it means a lot to me, and I like to remember it. It was this this time where we knew she was going to die that day, and we were all with her, just trying to tell her stories. And and you know, they say that the, the hearing's the last thing that people lose, and. Um, through the tears, we're trying to tell stories, and we're watching her chest, and it's like this tension that I had never felt before. And if anyone's been in this cir circumstance, you know it. You see the chest rising and falling, and you're you're almost hoping it stops because it's so hard, and you want that person to 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 be done. Like it, at that point, it was almost easier to photograph because she wasn't my mom anymore. She wasn't there. What made her my mother was gone. Um, and she deserved to be out of this pain that she had been in for so long. Um, and I took this photograph, and we continued to watch. And then eventually, actually, I think in a moment where we were all kind of looking away because it was like so intense, um, she stopped breathing. And it was strange this time around being in our own home. It didn't, I mean, it, it stopped feeling like our home because it was just such, it suddenly had this, these new memories with it. But we got all this time, we got a lot more time with her than we ever bargained for. Um, we had, oh, um, I had 28, 28 years with my dad and 29 with my mom. And that's more than my dad had with either of his parents and more than my mom had with her dad. So I feel lucky that I even got that. And they were really good years. And I know not everyone gets those kinds of years in a whole lifetime with family. Um, but I mean, I, I still, I would trade this photo essay to have them back, obviously, in a heartbeat. Um, but this was a strange moment, too, because I don't know where it came from. It was one of those, like, I need a photograph of them. I've never seen what happens after someone dies. Like, uh, and I waited for them to carry her out, and I, comp I knew what the composition would look like. I'd spent enough time in that house looking at every angle that I knew what this would look like, and I just decided I needed to have this photograph because it just felt so unreal. Um, I also knew that I had to have this photograph again, um, this time, obviously, without my mother, or with my mother front and center. And, you know, I love my parents both equally. I wanted to honor their memory the same way and their, tell their story, honor each of them and tell their individual stories. Um, but my mom requested that I not photograph her in the casket. So I was going to honor that, but I wanted to photograph. I needed this a moment like this. And so I actually I jumped out of the, the limo and jumped into the hearse to photograph from that inside out perspective. Um, Sometimes, especially with a personal story, that you've seen a situation so many times, you know your home so well or, or your, work, your office so well that you almost don't know how to see it differently. It was a challenge to start to see my, my life differently. But I pushed myself. And um, this photograph, we had, so we had planned to do the unveiling of my father's footstone. His, he died on December 7th, 2013. My mom died on December 6th, 2014. So we canceled the unveiling because my mother had died. And it was a day apart. And uh, we were going to be at the cemetery for her burial, which was just so strange because the, the headstone, the footstones, it's still cover, it's covered. We hadn't properly unveiled it yet. Because we, but we didn't think after all these years my mom would die like within the next year, within a day of a year. Like it, there were so many things that didn't make any sense, but then they also made perfect sense in some crazy, crazy way. I, I find that it all seems very poetic in my mind, um, how it all played out. And in some ways, that helps. Like maybe she, there, were, there was something magical at play that like they're together again. And she, like they knew, or I don't know. I, you rationalize how you rationalize. Um, and then this was, this is, we're near the end. This was Shiva after my mom passed away. And, and the focus really then became on, on us and my grandmother, who has now buried her daughter, buried her husband. And I reached out to the New York Times again. And I said, a third time? 
and they did, which is crazy. And what I didn't mention is um, after the photograph, after the piece, the first piece ran with my wedding, that was when I got to, I had the opportunity to start working for them, which was a dream, you know, like I got to freelance, I got to photograph the New York Times, but my mom was dying and I, I kept thinking, yeah, like this is a great opportunity, but I need to be with my mother. And it's so rare in the professional world that your, the people you work for know, know your personal story or know your personal life or really even care. Uh, but in this case, the editors knew what was going on, and I approached them and was explained how grateful I was for the opportunity, but I had to be home with my mom, and they were human about it, as it turns out, and just told me to touch base when I was ready to come back. Um, but this was, I was appreciative that, like with my father, they did this follow-up um, piece. And... Um, I'm going to finish with one more thing. Um, oh, after this, Lens blog also. So the print and online both published the story, which was amazing because they did 20. They ran 25 images in the gallery. Um, so what hasn't yet been published, and and again, why I call it ongoing, and with, I think with personal work, you just sometimes you don't know when it ends. For me, it hasn't ended yet, and we had to sell my parents' house. So we started to, to um, clear it out, which is why I started with those family photographs, because those are some of the ones that I found. And we've been, we went on this journey, uh, learning about my parents, learning about our childhood, things that were packed away in boxes, finding an album that my mother made about when she met my father, like in, this, like in their first year of dating. Um, a, lot of, a lot of really cool, it was a really, emotional but positive experience and I felt like it was important to document because I had heard about people going through this process but I'd never seen it um, and we did an estate sale which which if any of you have ever done an estate sale usually the the homeowner is not there but I insisted that I be there because I needed to photograph it um, you always have to insist if you want to photograph something you always have to insist and it was weird I'd hear people tell, wondering, actually one person was like, oh, this is interesting, I wonder what the story is. And I was like, well, I would like chime in, and they'd be like, oh. Um, but I just wanted to continue documenting it for me as I you know, went through the whole process. Um, and then our house, our house really became our home really became a house. It stopped looking like ours. It lost kind of all of its identity as ours as we cleared it out. And in some ways that was helpful because it helped us move forward and, um, and onward. And uh, sorry, I don't even know what time it is. OK, I'm OK, Stella. I'm almost done. Um, that's my brother. It was, it was strange. A, time, a place where you spend so much time and suddenly um, it's not yours anymore. But this, this time of year has changed. Um, my sister had a baby uh, a, month, a month before the anniversary. He was born on October 31st. And this time of year has been so heavy and difficult for us. And suddenly, there was new life, which has been really amazing and a gift. And his name is Phoenix. Um, I just These are just some that I threw in. Uh, and he represents this life in, you know, like rising. And, and it's, I mean, he has some big shoes to fill. Um, and, but it's just been really fun to have him around. It's also super weird. He looks a lot like my father. Um, but life goes on. That's why I kind of, I call it Cancer Family Ongoing because it, it's ongoing. And um, yeah, so I just, now, now new chapter and moving forward and um, and I get to look back and I have this amazing archive of my family and so I encourage people to to think about that I think especially in this time the holiday season is like all like you know it's hard to not think about family or life or love and um, if you're thinking about a project that a personal project um, to, to really consider it um, okay, so how about I stop and I can take a couple questions, if anyone has any questions. And then I have one more thing after questions, so thank you. Um. <laughs> yeah? You know, 
I kind of went through something similar some years ago, but whenever when I tried to take images, dissociating from it and keeping it objective without letting my emotions take over too much, how did you handle that? I I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he said just like how I was able to kind of detach my emotions from and be objective, and be objective uh, in this circumstance. In the moment, I have no idea. In the moment, I was, I, I just, my camera was a part of me and I just like took pictures. And I, I mean, there were a lot of bad pictures too. I'm not showing them here. But I, I think because I was shooting a lot, I think. You, it's all, I, I was continuing to try to like to sharpen my tools, you know, with assignment work, with photographing dogs, whatever. I was always photographing and looking at a lot of other work. So when I started photographing my parents, I almost I had almost prepared myself technically, and I think I was in so much disbelief by the situation <laughs> that I. Like sometimes I even forgot that they were my parents. Like momentary, momentarily, I would forget they were my parents, um, which is strange because then I would remember. But I was so it was I, somehow I I really don't know how I did that, but I'm so glad I did because I think if I hadn't been photographing, I would have been a, a mess. I think I just would have collapsed and f photography for many is this is a way that you see helps you tell the story of how you see the world and how you um, process the world and and so that's I was able to do that in some crazy way I guess so the question was about um, when it was first published in the Times how many images I had and how many I had to sort of edit it down to because when I asked the editors how many images do you want to see they said mm, like 50. And I probably shot, I, I, it's hard for me to remember now, but I think I photographed something along the lines of maybe like a couple thousand. <laughs> because it, at this point it had been almost a year and I, I almost was photographing with desperation. I, I wanted to photograph these moments, but then I didn't want to miss anything and I, it was almost, I was almost moving too fast. And at a certain point I slowed down. Um, but I, I think in the end, what I ended up sending them, they said 50, I think I sent them 150. <laughs> I was like, you have to understand, I'm so close. Every single picture has a special meaning to me. And I didn't know how to, I, I, some I was like, okay, I could tell this is an, a nice photograph <laughs> compositionally in the light and everything. But some, I just felt like the content was so important and the context was so important that it needed to be part of the larger story. But the first publication, they only ran six images, which was, difficult and that's often the case where people they an outlet will say we can run 12 about 12 if it's online and that's a lot but it's also very little if you've been working on a project for a long time um i don't know if that answered my, your question did you look from the beginning you were shoot black and white or what's your certain so it's funny i wrote that down as one of the questions people always ask me um that I, meant to, that I meant to cover when I was talking before. When I learned photography in high school, I learned on um, Tri-X 400 black and white film, and I learned what it meant, like I learned what the world looked like in black and white. I loved the whole process, and black and white to me always speaks to memory for me and archive, and so there were many reasons that black and I, I shot this and it's digital, but I shot it in black and white from the get-go. I couldn't tell you what most of these look like in color. I don't really remember because I've never looked at them in color. Um, there were so there were also so many different situations, and it was very jarring to go from the hospital to the house to the pool, like to the point where it really took you out of the story. And the colors to me also were not important. It was the, sto the context was important. There are certain stories where the color is absolutely important. And to me, it, it didn't play an important role in the story. So I, I made the decision that it was going to be black and white. And I, from the very beginning, I mean, from almost the very beginning, I just immediately, when I would um, import them into my computer, I would, I would change them over immediately. So I didn't even have a chance to see I mean, obviously, in memory, I kind of remember some of them, but it just it 
it had, I wanted the thread to be very um, clear going through from situation to situation. And also, it gives it a sense of timelessness in the way that this could happen at any time, in any place, in any part of the world. There's no, like, the color clues were not important. Um, and I felt like, yeah, my parents were young, but I know that this could happen, like, this happens to people of all ages and, and in all places. So I, I had a very, I, I think it's important when you make a decision, especially I've been told this, in a color world, if you're shooting in color or black and white, to have, to really be able to stand behind it and explain why. Um, so I appreciate you asking that because I'd like to be able to explain my intentions since it's my work. Yeah? What were some of the technical um, challenges that you had in terms of exposure, in terms of lighting? Um, some of the technical challenges I had were, I mean, I never touched, I, I worked, I never used additional light. I never touched the light. I never. Um, I used natural and ambient, whatever was found. And in the hospital, it was especially challenging because there was sort of this neutral tone that, in, especially in black and white, it was just kind of gray. It was really, it was hard. And and know, so so knowing that early morning light is often a bit more dramatic and contrasty, and knowing that golden hour evening light, um, I just I made a, I made sure to really be aware of the light and. Obviously, there's some really dark situations that ultimately didn't make the cut because it was just too dark. Um, and I also had to be very still, ha uh, using mainly using that 35 millimeter, one four open at one four. I could I could get a light in a dark in the darkness, but um, I'd have to be very still. So a lot of my moment, a lot of the photographs are pretty still. Um, they're not very active. Some people have asked me, you know, why don't you include photographs, like more painful, gritty photographs from, I, yes, exactly. <laughs> you just made a face, like, really? The story, I, yeah, cancer can be gritty and painful and illness and death and all of that. But in my parents, they, that's not how they told their story. They, it was quiet and it was, there was a lot of joy in the sadness. <coughs> and so that's how I photographed it. I tried, to, I didn't, I tried to just tell it how I saw it and how I felt it. Um, but there, you know, in the sanctuary, I made sure, you know, I, I had to bump up my ISO because I knew, I knew it was going to be kind of dark. And I had to have, like, really think about that. But there was a lot of window light, which is my favorite. <laughs> so I was lucky. It was, I mean, there were obviously some challenges, but there was a lot of, I just kind of always was looking for the light. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, uh, it seems like a tough subject to get up and be consistent. I don't know how often you do this and talk about sort of living through this again. Have you reached out to, or has anyone reached out to you from <coughs> cancer awareness organizations or organizations that help uh, deal with cancer? Um, I've had, I, I haven't really, I've only spoken, I spoke once at an event for the Les Garden Foundation um, for pancreatic cancer. A lot of people have reached out from these organizations to share their responses to it, uh, not necessarily about presenting it, but I have presented it um, quite a bit. And it's funny, I actually, I usually, I usually just talk through the photographs and, and, and explain as I'm going, and I don't like to have notes with me because it's, it's really about my life, so I can speak to it. Um, but there has, I've reached out to them too, and, and um, I would like to, I'm, I'm hoping, the, the, work, the work has been published a lot now, and it has, I have a couple exhibitions that are, are sort of in the works that I would like, that I'm, I'm hoping to collaborate with, with some cancer organizations um, on that, especially because I feel like one of the one of the reasons I really like to talk about the work and, and our story is I've it's been so meaningful to me to be able to share the story and grieve with the arms of strangers, thousands and millions of strangers around me. I've never been felt alone and I'm forever grateful. And I realize that there are a lot of people who don't have that and don't get the chance to share. And um, so one of the things I want to do now, too, is uh, through reaching out to organizations, but also um, with these exhibitions coming up, I'm 
I'm asking people, if they haven't already, to, re to share their stories with me. My hope, is, I mean, if it's just to share with me, then so be it, because maybe sharing with a stranger feels good, because that it certainly did for me. Um, but also, with a couple of exhibitions coming up, I would really like to be able to, in the way that I've honored my parents, I'd like to be able to honor other stories, too maybe including fo family photos and stories in my exhibitions as well, um, which actually, sorry, tangent. Um, at the front here, I have a couple of things, if anyone's interested. Um, I have a, a, a photograph that has information on the back. If you'd like to share your story, or be open to sharing your story. Um, and I also have an envelope where I am asking people if they'd be again, open to sharing their story with me if they would write it. I think I have found that I've, 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 I've read these amazing stories that people have emailed me, but there's something to be able to see someone's handwriting, I think, and, and feel like the human connection there has been really meaningful. So I'm trying an experiment with snail mail. Um, I also, some people notice that, that little box on the table, that little box of the ballerina, or haven't noticed it, it's there. Um, I have, I, with the exhibitions coming up and potentially a book, and I, my, my hope is to really start more of a conversation. There were so many things I feel like I learned well, when my parents were living and dying that I don't think you need to wait until you're losing a loved one to experience. It's had such a profound experience on my life, and I think conversation just really, my mom always said to keep talking and keep communicating, so I'm trying. <laughs> um, so if you want to keep in touch, uh, or like be in the loop with what's happening with this and, and potentially some events and, and I'm not really sure where it's going. I'm still, we just, we just had the two year anniversary of both of their deaths last week and um, of the first year of my mom's and the second year of my dad's and just trying to uh, figure out what's next with it. But I think creating a community and being able to say, oh, that exact story happened to this person, like, can I introduce you? Because it's, I've gotten that a thousand times over. So if you have like a, a business card or you want to leave your contact info and leave it in the box from, I've, we cleared out my parents' house like I showed you and I found that, it was mine. Um, that's something I would love to hear your stories. Did you have a question? Yes, I do. I wanted to know, um, did you use one lens for the whole project to keep it cohesive? So when I first started, I had my whole bag of lenses. Because especially shooting news, I'm like, OK, I have my 35-1.4. I have my 24 to 70. I have my, I didn't really, I never brought my 70 to 200, because I knew I never wanted to be at that kind of distance with them. Um, and I had an 85-1.4. And I had two camera bodies in case something failed. Uh, it was a lot of gear to carry around. And it, it seemed like too much. And I decided that if I, you know, those old lessons in photo school, like if you want to get closer, if you want a tighter shot, you get closer. So I decided that I was going to really try to just stick to one or two lenses. And that way I could be mobile, but also I wasn't futzing around with it and really just in the moment. So I, I generally, most of the images ha were shot with my 35-1.4, my favorite lens. Um, some of them were shot with the 85 and on occasion the 24 to 70. Um, like the the the, semi, the the funeral, and um, most of the time until the last part with my mother, it was I was shooting with a D seven hundred Nikon, and and once around the time that I was photographing my mom at the end of her life, I had gotten a D four S, which was so amazing, <laughs> um, <laughs> and. I wasn't always looking at the photographs also. Sometimes I just upload them and then to, I would upload them to my computer so I didn't accidentally um, format my card and lose them. Um, but I didn't look at everything right away. I like needed time before I could, before I could start to edit them. Um, I also carried around, uh, I had um, a Sony recorder that I just, whenever, you know, my parents were okay with me recording things, so I just had it with me always because a lot of really interesting conversations would happen, and I, I wouldn't want to sit there writing the, writing notes because I wanted to be shooting as these things were organically coming up, and that's been really I found that to be really helpful. I would even listen to some of the recordings. I would listen to some of the recordings um, of my dad while my mom was still alive, and I think that even in, that sort of shaped some of 
my process photographing my mom. Since then, I have not listened to any of it. I actually, I hired someone to transcribe because I want to know what they said. Is that my brother? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, he'll find his way. Um, I think that's him. I wonder if he even, like knows I'm here. Um, anyway. He's also a photographer. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I lost my train of thought. Anything else? Any other questions? Comments? How were your siblings with the whole project? Good question. People ask that. Um, they were fine. Well, my brother being a photographer, he he totally got it. If anything, he... You know, like the, right after my dad passed away, I was frozen, and he was like, "Are you are you gonna take a picture?" And I was like, "What?" Uh, like I, I, and then I did. Like he he got it and was supportive. He actually photographed me on occasion, um, while I was shooting, because I'm not in any of my photographs. Uh, my sister was supportive as long as my parents were okay with it. And once it was, it was strange once it was published because it wasn't just my story that was being put on the pu public stage. It was all of our, it was our family, you know, like out there. And, and I think ever, I mean, once it was published, I think that really had a big impact on the whole family because people from every corner of our lives and our past reached out and shared. And, I, and so I think we all got to experience that support that came in. Um, so I, I mean, I, I know how I know how lucky I am that I had, that my parents were so supportive and okay with this. Many people say to me, you know, like, oh, my mother would never let me do that, and that's every you know, like everyone's different, and and I am grateful that they did because I I think about them every day, you know, and I look at their photos every day, so. Uh, how did people react to the funeral? Um, at that point, the piece had been published uh, in the in the New York Times, and so everyone was pretty familiar. And my dad, you know, like he he made sure everybody knew about it. Um, and I, you know, I sat, I I stood up there and I said, "You might have all noticed I have a camera on my shoulder. Uh, I would really like to photo take a photograph from this moment to because." You all represent the story, that my father's story, my mother's story, and I think it's an, it's important like to to remember how like this love and the support, um, and you're all a piece of who they a, a little piece of who they were. Um, so people, it's interesting. Some people are in the photograph. Um, some people are smiling. Some people because nobody knew nobody knew what to do. Like it was kind of a surprise when I was like. Um, hey, by the way, like I'm gonna do this. They were like, wait, people were tear, you know. Um, <coughs> but people really, people comment and comment uh, commented after, and we're like, we kind of, we thought you might take some pictures at the funeral. Like it, they would have liked. They liked that, you know. Like I asked my parents before they died. I was like, I'm I'm planning on continuing to photograph. My parents were okay with it, and. So people were, I mean, I think there were some people who maybe didn't want to be in the photo, and I could tell when I looked deeply into the picture some people turning away, but, yeah. Yeah? I thought it was amazing, first of all, uh, the courage it must have taken to do this. It really Thanks. touched me, and that's just a comment, but I have no question at all. I just thought it was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.